welcome everyone to uh, tonight. It's an absolute honor to be here. Um, you all know me uh, by now. Most of you know me. And it's wonderful to actually present tonight behind the scenes what it takes to make a wildlife documentary. Um, and there we have a beautiful gorilla, a black back at that stage called Kaku from Otsala National Park. Cool. So I'm going to start off. If I were to ask any one of you to tell me a story, I always wonder what you would do. You would start thinking, is, do I have anything worthwhile telling? Um, do I have anything to tell? Uh, well, if you think about all the stories that uh, Shaharazad from uh, Arabian Nights, well, her life depended on telling stories. The question is, why are we so anxious about telling stories? Uh, we all read, most of us. We all listen to either radio or television. And we all tell stories eventually somewhere in our lives. So why the angst? when it comes to storytelling. What's the secret to telling a really good story? And that is only one word, and it's called documentation. Now, this is the verb, not the noun. If you document and you document enough, this is reading, this is writing, keeping a diary, making voice notes, making little video clips of yourself on social media, which I'm really bad at, you get better and better and better at it. So please uh, document and document away. And that's what we do at Homebrew Films. We document. We recount the stories that most of us on the screen are familiar with, um, with in nature, in an audible, a visual, and a cognitive manner. So we call it filmmaking, you call it cinematography, uh, or wildlife documentaries. Uh, that's what we do. And that's what I'm going to tell you all about and how we do it and um, what it's all about. So the production process. Well, very easily said, there's three steps. So it sounds very, in, uh, well, it's rather in, it's easy when you look at it like this. The first one's rather easy. We call it pre-production. Then you have the production itself. And then we have post-production. So I'm going to go through each of these and tell you uh, how many people are involved and what we actually do um, in every single one of these steps. So pre-production, there I am with my feet <laughs> firmly on my desk, um, enjoying my life and booking flights and whatnot. So what is pre-production? Now, pre-production is where we start with research. So we have an idea, we have, we think we have a story, and now we need to do research. We need to get content. We need to uh, create uh, contacts with lots of people and find locations. And that's what my colleague Aisha, that's somewhere on the screen, uh, that's what she does at the moment. That's what I did when I started here. Um, and that's a rather long process. Then we go over to script writing. And script writing is an art. Not everyone can write. Uh, there's brilliant writers out there um, to help us tell the story, to help us put the idea to paper and make sure that it's actually filmable. And that's what a script looks like. Um, this is a paper edit. So um, there's lots of notes on it. There's two columns, uh, the pre-title tease. That's usually what you see before you see the title. So it's beautiful imagery, wonderful music, and blah, 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 blah. And then we start off with the David Attenborough voices say, this is the last lion on earth or something like that. But a script looks like that. Um, and it has many iterations before we get to the voiceover artist. After that, you have the production team, and that's where I fit in. Now, we do all the logistics, the paperwork, the filming permits. You are thinking, and that's what we do. So that's a lot of paperwork and a lot of hours and a lot of phone calls um, and Zoom meetings and, 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 and. Cool. And then we have the role players in pre-production. And that is most of the people on the screen tonight. And without you guys, it's almost impossible to make a film. We talk about the national parks and reserves that we film in, private reserves that we film in. Uh, for international films, we uh, have filming commissions that we need to contact. We talk to ministries, we talk to departments and individuals and researchers without whom we cannot even start dreaming of producing anything. So that's the pre-production stage. 
And then when all of that is done, we do the production itself. Now I have the crew there and it, it, it differs for a wildlife documentary or a commercial or a feature film. Um, usually in a wildlife documentary, uh, you have fewer people. Uh, in At Homebrew Films, we, we, we usually send five people into the field, uh, two cameramen, one of which is a director of photography. So that particular individual um, a films, he or she films, and they direct. And then one cameraman, a sound engineer, a data wrangler, and then a production uh, member, like myself or someone else. A commercial, that's a massive crew of a lot of people, and that's fast and furious work. And then a feature form, that could be anything from 80 to 200 people. Uh, we've all seen the credits uh, running at the end of a film, and then you see all those names, and every single individual is part of a very important process. Oh, you have presenters. So you have the David Attenboroughs and the Dave Peplers and the, um, uh, well, call them who you want, um, these wonderful individuals with beautiful voices and beautiful mannerisms uh, that keep you glued to the screen. You have the director. Now, this particular individual can or cannot um, use a camera. So uh, most of the directors at Homebrew Films, they don't film themselves. They just direct the filming done by the cameraman. But these people are very, very important. And they are involved in every single step from the pre-production to the script writing, um, all the way through to the editing process. Uh, really important people. And then we have the camera operators, the camera assistant, the sound operators and the data wranglers. And all these people are incredibly important without which you cannot even start dreaming of doing anything. Uh, they all have a very specific and a very uh, technical uh, uh, job, and they're all trained in their various fields. You find very few people who are all of them at once. They can, I mean, most of them can do everything, but if you want to do it right and uh, as good as you can, you have an individual that specializes in every single one of those fields. And then location specialists. Yet again, most of you on the screen, a fixer. Now, these people make lots of money. So if I want to go to Namibia, I call, um, there's usually people that help me with um, the permits, the locations, getting around in the country, um, and all of those wonderful things if you form in a distant country or somewhere, somewhere outside of the country's borders. You have science advisors. This is really important in uh, nature documentaries. You want to recount a story that is true and that is accurate. And you can't do that if you don't have science and hard facts um, behind you. The game rangers are really important. We can't film in national parks. Um, we can't film dangerous animals without the game rangers. Uh, these individuals are really important and they keep the crews safe. Um, in the field and they drive us around and uh, make life wonderful and then if and it happens a lot that we want to film an animal that you can't find well they are in the wild but it's really difficult to find in the wild you have animal wranglers um, these people specialize in actually wrangling animals <laughs> so um, we had uh, we've had snake wranglers we had scorpion wranglers um, well I did that but um, uh, th these people are really important to make filming possible and you would be surprised how many of the really big production houses in the world the BBC National Geographic Terra Mater all of those actually make use of animal wranglers so that's actually a job um, if you can uh, teach your cat how to um, walk <laughs> walk over the screen or across the camera, then you're an uh, animal wrangler and you can actually make money out of that. And there we have the crew. Well, that was a small crew. We were filming for um, National Geographic. Uh, that's me in uh, that orange um, bomber jacket. And the whole crew there, uh, we were filming a film on um, the scarcity of water. Um, that was really cool. That was really nice. We were out in the field for three weeks uh, filming, and that was the very last day of, uh, um, of the film, which was really, really cool. Cool. Now we get to post-production. Now, post-production is when we're done filming. So we get back to the office, and now we are going to start editing. So putting all of that footage together, and this is, a re this is where it gets technical really technical you have an assistant editor that person is the one that takes the raw data and puts it all on one single timeline i'll show you what a timeline is now and then when that's done you go to the offline editor the editor that actually 
puts the story together, chooses the music and makes it pretty. And they work together with the edit producer and the script writer and the director to make something really beautiful and worthwhile watching. Oh, so what you see in front of you is a screen grab of a editor's uh, desktop. So that's what it looks like. What you see there, I'm just going to point out the green, if you can see the pointer there, that's the music. So that's the music that we choose that builds uh, momentum and excitement and a segue from one, one image to another. And then uh, the brown bits there and the blue bits, that's footage, that's actual footage that we recorded with the camera. And then uh, the pink on top, that's voice, that's voiceover. So that's either the presenter or the voiceover artist that, um, that we got in to do um, uh, to read the script out loud. So all of those are called layers. And in the end, you superimpose all those layers together and that's when we deliver. But that's what an editor gets to look uh, gets to look at and that's what I myself or well, myself and the directors look at every single day um, to make sure everything is fine, everything is beautiful and it actually is, uh, like I said, something worthwhile watching. So that screen I've seen maybe too many times in my life. Cool. The post now, now we get to something that's really, really cool. Once we've told the story, once the editor has the whole thing top to end, and it's all there, we have everything, it's beautiful, the story's told, the music's in, then we go to something called color grading and um, final mixing. This is a really cool process, and it takes a long time. So to explain that a little bit, I need to get a bit technical. When we go out into the field, we have very specific technical specifications that we, or camera settings that we film in. Now this, um, we call them S-logs or whatever. There's, there's lots of terms that I don't know, but that allows us to change the color or to color in the picture at the end of the process. And this is really important. So I'll show you a video clip in a moment to show you the difference between raw footage and then footage that has been color graded and, um, and final mixed. Well, what is final mix? Final mixing is making sure that the music and the voiceover artist and all the sounds that are necessary to make the, pro to make the program really worthwhile listening to is all on par and on a given level. That's really important. Otherwise, you don't want the, to, a jump in the music or there's beautiful music and then all of a sudden a strange noise and whatnot. And that particular person, the sound engineer, makes sure that everything sounds wonderful. That's also a big job. Now, I'm going to show you a video. On your uh, well, well, my left-hand side, you can see uh, the lemurs of Madagascar. Now, the Image is a bit blurry, it's dark, that's a raw footage. So raw footage, that's directly from the camera. We haven't done anything to it whatsoever. And then on my right hand side, you see it's bright, it's colorful, it's beautiful. So now I want you to listen carefully to, um, uh, uh, to what it sounds like. And I hope, uh, yes, I did. So I'm gonna stop and start and then I'll explain to you what we are actually listening to. Like monkeys. Ringtails are highly social and live in large groups of up to 30 individuals. Did you hear the difference in sound? So the first, the first bit sounded very boxy, very, um, very boxy, very, uh, it's not, that was just a simple recording in a little room like the one I'm sitting in now, usually by the edit producer or by myself. The second part was done by a voiceover artist. You could hear the smoothness in the voice. You heard extra sounds. And that's what final mixing is all about. So we included birds and noises and the uh, sound recordings of the lemurs. I'm going to play again and then uh, keep, uh, keep your uh, ears open and for the differences. Like monkeys, ringtails are highly social and live in large groups of up to 30 individuals. But unlike monkeys, Here again. in this troop, the females are in charge. Okay. The males are at the bottom of the pecking order. And the females frequently remind them. So that was a really good example 
of, on the left-hand side, what we in the office or in the edit studio see throughout the process until the end. And the end product is on the right-hand side. That is what you get to see when you watch it on whatever platform, whatever screen there is to watch. Cool, now let's go on to post-production because it really is a very long process. Um, we have what we, we call QC, quality control, as in any other given process. In the world, we have quality control as well. So once we're done, we send the final product to the client and they run it through various programs to do quality control. This is to check anything from uh, jumping images, dead pixels, which they often are, um, problems in sound, problems in anything. So then we get a report back. And usually, and hopefully you get a clean report and then everything's fine and you can do the final delivery. And the final delivery is quite a process. And this process starts way at the beginning when we do pre-production. There's lots of paperwork that you need to uh, comply with. There's lots of rules, there's lots of regulations, there's memorandums of understanding, there's contracts, and, 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 and. And I'm gonna show you a few of the things that we uh, have to keep in mind when we do the delivery process. Now, the first thing that we need to keep in mind, this is very technical, are uh, the video specifications. Now you can see there, I just took um, what Waterbear, um, that this is their delivery spe uh, is, uh, specifications. And we have to follow these uh, specifications to the T to make absolutely sure that we are able to deliver the program. So these are very specialized people that sit um, with us and they make sure that we have the correct frame rate, the correct aspect ratio, the format, uh, the bit rate, and all of those things that I don't, always actually understand, but this you have to make absolutely sure when you start the filming process that you do all of this correct. So all of these things that you see in front of you are actually um, settings on the camera that you have to be aware of before we even start filming. Um, that's really important. Then we have the audio specifications, because remember when I showed you the, uh, the screenshot of the edit, um, of the, uh, the edit screen, um, there was various tracks, the, the, the footage itself, and then the sound. Now, the sound has specs of its own. And this we also need to fo follow when we record sound in the field. And then when we record sound in the studio, when we do voiceover artist um, recordings. And then when we do the play out. So when we put everything together and we play it out, we have to make sure there's uh, all the channels are there, the bit rate's fine, the sample rate's fine. And, um, and, 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 and the list goes on and on and on and on. And then this is where, um, this is almost my final, my, uh, my final job in the process, the deliverables and the checklist. Now, all of these things need to be delivered with the actual video file. It's not only one file you send, it's the texted video. So that's the video with everything on it. The subtitles, if they are, if they are lower thirds, lower thirds are what we call name straps on when your name appears on the screen, the, um, the dialogue, the music needs to be on its own, uh, the effects needs to be on its own, there needs to be a trailer, you send all the subtitle files, you need to send in a synopsis of what you do, post the images, um, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. So it's a massive file that you send to the client at the end of the process to make absolutely sure that the program that you deliver is not easily duplicated um, at the end of the process or when it is viewed or sold to anyone. And then you get this very complicated looking, um, well, this is an Excel spreadsheet from, uh, this is from the channel. This is from one of the channels that we, we deliver to. Um, and you call it a running order. So running, um, in what order do the programs run on, um, on the channel? So this is a really important, very important document because all of these codes, you see the UID, you need something, something I've never known what it stands for, but that code is really, really important because when you send it, when you send the file to the channel, you have to have that correct code. Otherwise, when you tune in, on seven o'clock on a Sunday evening and you want to watch Grun 
as this DAO and we didn't use the correct code, then you're going to see a completely different program or the worst possible imaginable case is there's not going to should be anything to look at. And um, you get fined incredibly, uh, really big fines if you do this incorrectly. So this is a really important process and something that we triple check in the end, um, just to make absolutely sure that it is done correctly um, and to the correct specifications. So timelines. Um, and this is a question um, I get asked often how long does it actually take to do a proper wildlife documentary now you have to keep in mind um that you get various types of documentary you get series like we did Grun. Um, i'll show you that a bit now and that was 13 episodes of 24 to 25 minutes each you get um one hour specials that's usually 50 to 55 minutes each um in any given time so it takes a bit of time it, it depends on what you're doing but just in general, if for homebrew forms, um, this is what we do. So pre-production, uh, the, the, the stage where we start off with um, the ideas and the planning and writing proposals and calling people, this can take a few months to a couple of years, um, all depending on um, the quality of your, uh, of your idea and your pitching document and whether or not anyone wants to buy in on the idea that you want to do. Filming for homebrew films, we usually take four weeks out in the field. This is with or without a script. Now, um, this is where this is a very big difference between how we do things and how a production house like uh, the BBC does things. The BBC goes in with a script. So they know that they want to film an orangutan coming down a tree in Borneo at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's why they stay there for three years until they get the shot. Now, that's an incredibly expensive process, and we're in South Africa, so we don't have that, <laughs> that amount of money to do. So we go in without a script and we film absolutely everything that we can, um, and then we come back and then we create a story. Uh, so, but we do go in with a broad idea and a very good idea of what we are, what we are able to uh, form, uh, what we can form. We use the researchers and make use of all the context that we can to get as much footage as possible. But it's usually a four-week process in the field. Then the data management. When the crew comes back from the field, we take at least two weeks to make sure that the data, the actual raw footage, is usable by the uh, the editors. So we have a, a, a massive team of people, uh, wonderful people, um, that make sure that all the data is ready, uh, they transcode it, they make it usable, uh, they put it into systems and through stuff, and it's it's a massive system. But it takes usually two weeks to, um, to, uh, to get the data on a server. And we're talking anything from goodness, from two terabytes to we came back with 52 terabytes of information or footage, 52 terabytes of footage uh, when we got back from the Congo on our last trip, which is quite a bit of footage. The editing, anything from one to three months. So usually in the editing process, we have a few stages. You have a rough cut. That's the very first cut that we see. And that's a very loose cut. It's, it follows the script loosely to see if there is a story. Does it make sense? Do we need to change the script? And then you have, um, after that, you have another cut and another cut, and then you have a final cut. And that final cut, once it's signed off, it gets sent to the color gradist and the um, sound engineer to fix up. Grading, the color grading. Do you remember those uh, the images of the lemurs? the one where it was blurry and dark and mudgy, and the other one was really colorful, that takes about a month. That's a really, uh, it's an intense process. And um, they're probably also the people that make the most money in um, in the filming industry. Uh, they have to make sure that the color actually looks like um, it did in nature. Uh, so they it's color by numbers, but it's a, it's a long and a time consuming process. And the sound engineering, usually a week, that we give the uh, the sound engineer to make sure that all the sounds are wonderful, that it makes sense, that you don't hear an elephant when you see a lion or you hear a hyena when you see a jackal. It does happen. It does happen. So um, just to make sure that everything is as it should be. And then we send it off to the client for uh, quality control. And hopefully it comes back with a thumbs up 
and Bob's your uncle. So one of the uh, ones that we did, and Dave Pepler was on um, Unlocking Nature two weeks ago. Uh, we have Groen Congo with Dave on Water Bear at the moment. If you don't know what Water Bear is, please go and subscribe. It's uh, the waterbearnetwork.com. Um, and there's wonderful things uh, to watch. Uh, Groen is there. And then um, a lot of other uh, wonderful programs. It's basically the um, the conservation YouTube of the world or the conservation Netflix of the world. So Water Bear is really cool. And watch out for Groen there. It's one of our pride and joy um, productions. We've done over 400 episodes of Groen uh, at Homebrew Form. So it's one of our flagship uh, programs when it comes to our nature documentaries. Now, I'm going to play you two videos. They're exactly the same. The one, and this is all about storytelling, the one is without sound. And the other one, the next, the, the next version that I'm going to play is with sound. And then I'm going to explain or ask you what, what may one of two of you at the end, what did you think? What changed in your mind? How did you feel um, after you've seen both? Which one do you like best? Cool. So I'm absolutely sure that all of us can agree that, well, it's beautiful. It's beautiful imagery. We got some emotion out of it and what whatnots. But did you actually enjoy it? Could you watch a whole hour of this without any sound? Um, I mean, there's questions that come up. What does it sound like? What does it sound like? What is it to be there? It's not an immersive um, feeling or exercise that you're doing. So now I'm going to play the clip again but the final mix or the final version of what it sounded like when we're done with the process. So that was a bit jumpy, but I mean, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. This was, my, it was so much more immersive. This was so much more emotive. It was wonderful to watch. And you wanted to go there. You wanted to be there. And that's what the magic of filmmaking and producing is. But to get to this stage, you need so many people that work together. It really is a team effort to make something beautiful um, out of well, just quiet footage. So... You want to do it. You want to maybe one day be where I'm sitting now. Uh, if you really want to do it, I don't know. Um, so what's the first step? There I am. I was still studying. I think the, the, the top picture was my first master's year. That was at the uh, De Mont Estuary. And the bottom picture was uh, 2010 in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. So you need to have a love for nature and an interest in television. Um, not even, I mean, the interest in television isn't that important, but at least you need re you, you need to love nature, um, as we all do. And then it really helps if you have a postgraduate degree. And I'll tell you why. Be when you start off in the wildlife documentary um, um, making process or the, um, um, or the industry, 
you start off as a researcher. Now, Aisha, my colleague, she's somewhere on the screen, can attest to this. Um, we're going through a process now with a wonderful um, producer from, from the UK. And um, you need at least four years of experience of doing research before you can even start producing any wildlife documentary. Ages ago, she told us that you needed 10 years of experience as a researcher. This is with a doctorate in any of the natural sciences uh, to have worked for the BBC. 10 years of research. And research is, it's a tough job. You need to, it's a lot of computer work. It's a lot of reading. It's a lot of phone calls. It's a lot of emails. Um, so it helps. It helps to have a, a, a postgraduate degree or any type of degree. You don't have to, but it helps. So you go into research and writing, as I just said, it's quite a long process. If you're a camera operator, that usually starts very early on in life. When, you, when you're when you a little piccanini, you start taking photos with your phone or whatever. So um, these are very passionate people and you don't just become a really good camera operator. Uh, they start off as lonely cable bashers where they run after the, um, uh, the, uh, the camera guys. Uh, with the cables, making sure no one trips. And then they move on to camera assistants where they carry around the tripods or the camera or the lenses. And then only they become camera operators. Directors. Now, this is something that you've done uh, way. I mean, you've, you've done all of this and then you become a director. Um, it's not something that you just go and study for. Presenters, well, presenters are born, actually, um, and made. We train them. They go for vocal training, um, for, uh, for elocution lessons, and um, we learn them how to walk, what not to do, don't do this, don't do that, la, la, la. Um, production, that's where I'm in. Um, well, if you like administration and paperwork, production's for you. Uh, producing, now, usually producing is the very last step. That's the top of the tier. Um, that's when you... Um, you have the final say, you usually uh, have contact with all of the clients and you sell the pitches or the ideas to the various channels or the distribution houses all over the world. And then some extra bonus skills. Well, have a love for nature, have some scientific knowledge. If you can edit, that's wonderful. Um, and uh, have, having a, a working knowledge of some of the uh, better uh, editing software programs, that's really cool. If you can film, if you can write, if you can do admin, Bob's your uncle. Uh, there will be something for you to do in a production house. And then the most important thing of all, it is anything but glamorous. This is really important to remember. So it looks lovely. It's It sounds lovely, but it's not glamorous. It's not the Oscars. It's not the Samas. It's not the Grammys. It's not the whatever. Um, it's really hard work. Um, and it's very long hours. Uh, seven days a week, you're out in the field, you're out in the sun, you carry very heavy equipment, and sometimes a lot, a lot goes wrong. Um, I have horror stories that I'm not going to share with you tonight. So now I'm going to share you some of the photos um, that I have been associated with throughout the years, uh, starting with uh, Spark Talks, which was the precursor to unlocking nature. Way before COVID started, we had Spark Talks um, that we could homebrew collaborated with the LCA. And we had these wonderful talks um, with the youth in the studio. This is our studio on, on my right hand side. Um, in Cape Town, where we uh, invited speakers uh, to a live studio, we had an audience, we formed it all. It was absolutely wonderful. Left hand side, we have Ruan Pinor there. He's a, he's a cameraman and we were filming a beach cleanup. Um, we were working with the Beach Co-op, which is a company that does um, beach cleans up, a ble beach cleanup in, in Cape Town. Uh, that was really cool and lovely to, to be part of that. That's me um, trying to film something. I didn't. I can't remember what I did. It was way up in the north of the uh, uh, Kruger National Park, the Bafuri, and we were filming elephants in that particular day. And on the left hand side, the beautiful, beautiful Cape Leopard um, that we filmed for one of our documentaries. Um, I, I think her name was Sandy. I was I was deadly afraid that day. You were with her in in uh, in the enclosure, but it's still dangerous. She's a wild animal, and that's where animal wranglers and game rangers and researchers really play a very important part to make us tell the stories um, that need telling. And then there we go. There I am in the uh, Marakele National Park. We were filming the uh, the vulture colony. 
and that day me and Pumlani, a brilliant cameraman, and uh, we were on that ledge for weeks filming the um the vultures. It's hot, it's hot, it's warm, it's a massive hike. Um, it's it's quite an exercise. Um, I fell on that particular trip and broke the tripod. Um, I fell on it, uh, but it was funny. Uh, well, boom, boom, Lani laughed, and then on the right hand side, there we are. That's me at the, at the back with a little backpack carrying the tripod uh, in the Congo, um, walking to find something to film uh, animals or whatever. Um, so yeah, lovely, wonderful experiences, but really hard work. There we are in the Congo again. Uh, that's me in the middle with it's Claudio there kneeling, filming uh, an elephant there at the back, and that's Werner. Um, they both are senior wildlife um, cameramen and DOPs. Uh, wonderful guys they've done most of the filming and it's wonderful to be with them out in the field and learn as much as you can then on the left hand side there we are in port alfred we were filming for national geographic that was wonderful so that's what camp looks like so you have various tents the one tents for data wrangling the other ones for food or catering or the craft table where everyone eats and there's buses and there's people and it's madness and you just have to make sure that um, everyone does what they need to do. And if anyone slacks, then the whole process uh, comes tumbling down and you waste a lot of money. And then um, uh, just wonderful quote, there we are on the same shoot for National Geographic um, by one of the executive producers of uh, Planet Earth 2. There's always an element of luck. You can plan and hope and get the logistics in place as much as you like. In the end, Mother Nature won't read the script and animals don't turn up or turn up in the wrong place and do things you weren't expecting. And this is the secret to wildlife full making, to always be at the top of your game, to always make sure that you understand what you form as best you can so that you can anticipate as much as possible what the animals are going to do, uh, understand their behavior, read as much as you can, um, to make sure that you get all the most wonderful, wonderful um, imagery that you can. But this you can only do if the research was done um, properly at the very beginning of uh, the process. So now I asked you in the beginning and um, to tell us a story. Now I am going to tell you a story. So um, myself and the home routine, we're scientists. Uh, some of us are teachers like myself, and we're storytellers. But at the core of it all, it's all the same thing. Now, our stories are based on reality and the magic of it all. And to paraphrase the very verbose Sir Richard Dawkins, uh, the magic of reality, a little book he wrote. Now, the essence of science and storytelling and teaching is rooted in curiosity. Every single one of us are very incredibly curious people and we want to go out and we want to find out more and we want to form these beautiful animals like this wonderful, beautiful forest elephant in front of us. Now, good science and good storytelling and good teaching is both wrong and right. And they both are essential aspects to the entire process. Now, if we, the team and you, believe that something is possible, most likely is. And that is what the dreams are made of, if you remember the song. And remember, it's not the glamour of the Met Gala or the Oscars or the Samas uh, or what you see on any given screen, your laptop, your cell phone, or the television screen. But the glamour is in the roar of the lion and the whispering of the wind and the leaf. And the moment you first meet the gaze of a gorilla and the anger formed by a protective elephant matriarch, that is real. That is reality. And we, as a production house, as filmmakers and storytellers, have an obligation to show and tell the people of the world this reality, our reality. And that, according to me, is what documentary filmmaking is all about. Teamwork, curiosity, really hard work, and telling the real stories out there. And that is a color bar, and that is my story for this evening. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Prudence, and I will be 
facilitating today's Q&A. So if anybody has a question, you can lift up your virtual hand, you can write a question in the chat and we'll allow you to engage the Rowan. Um, in the meantime, I'll read a question from, um, I think it's Sibyl, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, they say, wonderful talk, Rowan. Would you love, would love to see as many of your productions as possible? Is there a list of what is accessible online? Uh, Sibyl, um, we are working really closely with Water Bear at the moment, and um, we're uploading a lot of our programs on there um, to make it more accessible, especially our wildlife, um, our wildlife documentaries. Most of those were for um, international uh, broadcasters, America, Canada, Germany, all over the place. So it's really difficult to share those with you. But the moment that we have um, some of our really cool documentaries on Water Bear, um, I'll um, put it here on Unlocking Nature and you can all go there and watch them. We have two really cool series that we are trying to upload. Well, we've been busy uploading now. One about the Two Oceans Aquarium that we did a few years ago here in Cape Town. Wonderful, beautiful documentary about behind the behind the scenes working workings of the of the aquarium that was lovely and then also one of the rhino orphanage uh, a rhino orphanage um in the waterberg which was absolutely beautiful so when those come up um i'll let you know and then you can go on water bear. It's all for free on water bear. you don't need to pay you don't you, you need data and that's all and you can watch it there and um but yeah that's that's it for now Cool. Thank you, Rowan. Uh, Prof Van Ans, we can take your question. I'm not going to take a question. I'm going to do something, and that is um, pre pre starting up. Um, I did the books I said behind specifically for Rowan and Marty said, um, but that's a, it's a stage picture. But to show you, it's not a stage picture. <laughs> I'll, I'll put the cabinet, Marty. And I actually put it after I showed you the book, people. So what I have in my hand here is actually Ruan's Masters. So oh, really, really proud of you, Ruan. Thank you. And Lisa, now you're going to tell us if you actually read it. <laughs> yeah, she did read it. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> we, had to. we read it a couple of times. It's like watching a program before we air it. You watch it over and over and over and over again. Yeah. The time at the end, you're, you're, you're nauseous when you see a gorilla, which sounds horrible. You're not, but yeah, you've seen them quite a while. <laughs> um, we have a question from the chat from Heather. They say, hi, Rowan. What editing program would you recommend for people who are starting out? Oh, Heather, that's a good question. So I would recommend to really understand editing and how music works with uh, with bass and cutting and all of those things. Use simple programs, the ones you use on your cell phone. Start start using that, really, in all honesty. There's, there's wonderful tools that you can use um, on um, any Android or any um, Apple device or whatever device you have. Start with those. And that then, just to get a feel for what bass is. So bass is when you have um, um, that the music fits beautifully with the imagery. When you when you go from one image to another, there's a shift in music or a shift in bass. So you have to get used to that and begin simple. And then you start going off to big programs like Premiere Pro or some of the Adobe programs. But really, if you're starting off Start with one of the uh, simple programs on your um, or the applications on your phone or your computer, and that's more than enough. You can do wonderful things with that. Um, so yeah, start off with any one of those free programs, and um, you'll get a um, you'll you'll do it. Cool, um, Marty. We can take your question. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rion. Uh, again, you make us jealous with uh, what you do, and I, I know it looks all glamorous and whatever. So thanks for also sharing some of the uh, interesting and difficult times. I mean, I watched a uh, one of the things was one of the Blue Planet series or whatever, where they literally then showed the behind the scenes, and I think it was the one with the um, snow leopard, and I think they sat there for three or four years, and they had like I don't know. 20 seconds or something like that, three minutes of, of, of footage. And yeah, I mean, it's just mind blowing that dedication. And I mean, in the snow and these tiny little things. So I'm sure you've got some really cool stories um, that you can share just of some of the, um, the the minimum reward for the amount of effort that you that you put in. 
Um, so that's the sort of one thing, maybe just tell us some more of those. And then the other thing, you know, you, know, you did the thing with the music in the background um, of, the, of the, the footage, but I think there's also those natural sounds that we just assume were there when you videoed, but there's like almost a whole library of clonking wooden boxes together and all sorts of other things to make fake noises. And how much of that is actually the the, the, the actual noise of the, the um, I think there was some sort of a water buffalo going through the stream or something like that, and it's actual, the noise. And how much of that is all, I don't use the word fake, but, <laughs> produced <laughs> noise um, <laughs> for, so for, for the natural sound effects. So. Okay, so I'm going to start with that, and then I'll move to the to the to to the story. So, um, uh, welcome to the greatest lie ever told. Um, so when we when we do film, when you film in 4K UHD, you don't record sound in the camera. You have a sound recorders next to you and they record as much as they can. But the equipment is incredibly sent. I mean, you hear everything. You can hear a plane a thousand kilometers off. So what we do, off, usually after we film the sequence or whatnot, everyone sits dead quiet and you record ambient noise wherever possible. Um, and that you can use in the edit. But, but that said, usually where the sound engineer... Um, has a whole library of sounds, splashing, the breaking of a tree, the growling, the rumbling of an elephant's stomach and whatnot. And all these are actual real sounds, but they might not have been recorded in the field. So you try as much as you can and as far as possible to record ambient sounds in the field and that you can edit in. But most of the sounds that you hear are from um, music libraries that you buy online or uh, one that you make yourself, um, that you have in your own um, in your own archive. Uh, so yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a bit of a, a that's a bit of a lie when we when we do that. But as far as possible, we try. Uh, a story of um, waiting. That particular um, um, that particular photo I showed you, where I was at with the camera and the bafuri, that was a very difficult shoot. Uh, we went up to the bafuri. Um, and there was absolutely nothing to film. There were no animals. For uh, some odd reason, that particular, <laughs> there were only birds and you can only do so much with the armor corp. Um, <laughs> so I, I told the crew what we have to do. We, we sat at that watering hole for four days. The whole day we sat there and waited for elephants or anything to arrive at the water hole. And eventually they did. And it was an incredibly um, exciting and dangerous situation uh, we were all hiding in the bushes I mean we were, and then the I mean the elephants were literally I mean, a meter away from me they didn't know we were there they smelled us but they couldn't see us we were we were hidden um but I mean you were right there um, that was one of the uh, cases uh, there's there's other cases we were in the Congo now um in Ozala and basically it rained for a whole week and then you can't film I mean you can only film the rain for so much so long you film everything you film the rain but a whole week's worth of rain that's a lot of rain and you can only tell a story so long um but there's so many stories of um cameras falling off tripods and uh, I mean anything that you can imagine going wrong it does go wrong on a filming expedition. Um, and then usually I get a phone call at one o'clock in the morning saying, oh, Ruan, the camera died or the cameraman broke his leg or something like that and you have to fix it. So this, this, this is great. We, we once had um, uh, one of our animal wranglers was bitten by a, a button spider and they didn't call me to tell me that it happened. He believed that he was going to be fine. He was not fine. Um, we had to rush him to the hospital. They were in the whip. Um, and I can't even, he went to Bredasdorp and he eventually ended up in Hermanus. I don't know where, but that was quite, that was quite a thing. So you always have to be mindful of, of, of that and the dangers because um, um, all of this is insured. Uh, just before the team goes out, you have to fill in massive insurance forms and then you have to be really specific about what they're going to film. Um, is it dangerous? Isn't it dangerous? Well, I mean, you know, but there's there's so many stories. It's cool, though. <laughs> Keeps you young. <laughs> thank you, Rowan. Um, Stephen, you can unmute and ask your question. Hi there, Rowan, and uh, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I need to echo the sentiments 
expressed earlier as well. It's it's um, by Chris. It's absolute fantastic work and very important role that you play. Um, just out of curiosity, um, in terms of it's a bit of a loaded question. In terms of VR 360 cameras, have you explored with them? Is there demand for them? Um, I've seen it been very, very effective, but I've also seen it go very, very wrong. Um, have you experimented with it? Is there is there room for that in the market? How does it impact your production uh, difficulty level? Um, so yeah, just comment on that. That'd be great. It's really difficult. It wasn't easy and it's never been easy. And I think that's why we never used it. Um, I think we, uh, we've only ever tried it underwater. Um, um, we've tried it once or twice, but it's really, really difficult because it creates a well, this is according to me, and I can be completely wrong, and there are going to be many people that are going to differ with me, and that's what the filming world's all about. But um, it creates a sense that, I mean, it removes you from the actual reality of it all because no no human can see 360 degrees. It, it, it's, it's weird. You, you turn your head and you see this and you see that. So it's really difficult to film with them. Um, and at Homebrew Films, we've, I have never, we've never done a production where I've used, uh, where we have used um, the footage from a 360 camera, just because it's really difficult to do. And you, it's very rare that you get um, to a place, a location that you find um, a view like that, that it that doesn't have a, a windmill or power lines or something, a road somewhere that you uh, can block off if you only form in one direction. So it's it's difficult. Um, there is room for it, of course. Um, I know for a fact that, um, especially in, I think, um, commercials, they use it quite often, but that's very specialized filming um, that I've never been involved with. Uh, but in wildlife, no, not as far. No, we haven't ever used it, no. Cool. Thank you, Han. Um, there is a question on the chat from Light Ngomane. They say, as an upcoming filmmaker, I want to know how do I get myself in the industry or get to work with such big programs or channels okay cool like that's a really good question <laughs> um <laughs> first of all I would, it would be cool to know where you're based um home reforms we're always up and open for interns um it's always good to come and do some intern work with us um aisha's gonna laugh now but um if i don't lose you then it's all good but um that's an inside joke i, I literally once lost uh, an intern in the building i forgot that we had him but it's fine but no like i'm just joking um the, the most important bit is to come and intern uh for one of the big production houses if you're in south africa just give me a call give homebrew a call and we'll always make some time and a space for you to start off and that's really important that's why i am I, I really need to emphasize this. It's not glamorous. You start off by getting coffee and carrying blocks and wooden scaffolding and cables and cameras around way before we, I even let you touch a camera. Um, so, um, but that, that's that's how you start. You have to start somewhere and um, there's always space for you at home reforms or any one of the other production houses. Um but that's usually the easiest way is to contact the production house like Homebrew Forms and ask them if they have internships. And that's where you start. That's where most of us started. And most of the people that um, work in my team were um, were interns at the beginning. And now they're head of their um, respective departments doing wonderful jobs, um, doing really important jobs. But that's how you start. Thank you, Rowan. Um, she says, what are the requirements for being a presenter? <laughs> good teeth <laughs> a good voice no, I'm oh. no i'm actually not joking it's very superficial <laughs> a good set of teeth a wonderful voice um you don't necessarily need a good demeanor um a lot of presenters don't have good manners but that's fine um <laughs> we can work around that <laughs> but um, usually what we tell people is to go for some type of voice training and voice coaching. That's really important uh, because this is really important. Not everyone on earth likes the same voice. 
Um, very few people enjoy South African accents because very few people in the world understand our accent. Um, so that's why they either use American accents or British accents or whatever. Um, if you make television for the Americas, then you usually use an American accent and it's very fast paced and it's the most dangerous animal. The most blah, blah, blah. Then you get the, uh, the rest of the world that love um, the Attenborough-esque uh, voice. And that's training. That's all. You just, they, they really are wonderful places and people that can train you how to use your voice, um, what diction is, uh, how to read, um, how to sound excited, and, 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 and. So that's really important when you want to be a presenter. And then you need to go and um, join an agency. And the agents usually get you a job. That's the easiest way. Otherwise, you go and stand in lines forever and do auditions and you never get into anything. So um, I would uh, suggest that go onto the websites of agents, talent scouts and whatnot, and get onto their websites. Uh, they record your voice and then um, you're in a library and then um, people like us from Homebrew go into the library. I might click on you and then whoop, Bob's uncle. And here you are doing the voiceover for us. But yeah, voice training is really important. Cool, you are. Cool, Rowan. I'll go since I've got good teeth. Nonko <laughs> Lulego, um, <laughs> you had your hand up and you dropped it. I don't know if you still have a question. Hi, sorry, I, I wasn't aware I dropped my hand. Um, well, I wanted to say thank you to Mr. Schlebusch and Skell on behalf of Rowan, the please, please, it's Rowan. I'm not that old yet. <laughs> 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 okay, Ryan. Well, I wanted to say thank you for the wonderful talk. And I wanted to ask you if you, during production, when you are out there filming, I wanted to ask you if you film everything or if you're like there for elephants and a leopard shows up, you're like, oh, a leopard. And then you go back to the elephants or you, you like film everything, everything that you see there. So I'm, I'm just going to uh, explain again. Um, this all depends on if you have a script or not. If you have a script, um, then you know exactly what you need to form. So then you only go for elephants. Huh? That's what you do. You form elephants because that's what the script says. Um, usually that's a lot of money. That's a lot of time. And most South African companies don't have that much time or that much money. So what we do, we go in, say we want to make a film about elephants. We go in, we know we want to form elephants. We form as many elephants as we can. But, but if there is a water monitor crawling out of the dam where the elephant's drinking, we form the water monitor. It might be some lack of story about something or whatnot. You form everything possible if there's time. And if it's possible, we form it. And then we either use it in the, um, in the edit or we don't use it. But, and then we put it in archive. We make good notes of that. Um, and then we can use it later on. So it all depends on what, uh, whether you go in with a script or not. But usually in our case, in the case of homebrew films, we have a good idea of what we want to form, but we film as much as we can. We film almost everything. Sunsets, sunrises, the moon, star trails, whatever animal, insect, spider, whatever you call it, we film it. Um, if, if we can and if we see it, though, I think we have as much as we can to make it as pretty as possible. Cool. Um, there's a question from Jerome on the chat. They say, do you sometimes use GoPros and phones for recordings? GoPros, yes. Phones, almost never. Um, it's, GoPros, especially if you do. We did a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, work now with a client. I'm not going to mention any names that we were flying in helicopters that we used GoPros. Um, it gives you access and it gives you um well, access that you don't really will have without other types of cameras. Um, you can do aerial photography with drones. Uh, we use drones quite often. Um, uh, uh, it's just a bit of paperwork and you need a, a trained a drone operator and you need a license and you need lots of lots of lots of lots of things. But GoPros a lot and then phones, not so much unless it is called for um, and the script uh, tells you that it is needed. But yes, GoPros, definitely. Hmm? Cool. Uh, hi, Andy, we can take your question. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Ron. Um, I just I needed to let you know I'm working on my David Attenborough voice. Um, it's coming on well. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> um, Can't wait. Can't I wait. I just wondered, if, in, terms of, 
yeah, I won't, I won't go to that. Right. Um, in terms of storytelling and the sort of films you're being commissioned to make, have you noticed a change and a move from to actually filmmaking that takes that story and is trying to change people's behaviours and attitudes towards the wildlife and conservation? And is there also a role looking forward of not only reporting on some of the problems that these wonderful things are facing, but actually trying to paint a picture of the beautiful world we want to make and where we're going um, so that people buy into that. And the story actually goes beyond now and into the future to, to inspire engagement. And, and is a, a voice for the animals as well. Sorry, there's a lot packed into there, but I wonder if, you know, a change in the role of filmmakings and is there, you know, responsibility on film producers to do more than just go, this is how it is. No, of course. Um, that all depends on who you sell your programs to. Uh, for the Vogue now, and it's very much a Vogue place. The Vogue now is uh, apparently, uh, it's all about biographies um, and people doing incredible work and telling their stories and, 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 and. So yes, it does change. It changes yearly, it changes by the season, it changes by the day. And it depends, it all depends on who you're selling um, uh, your programs or your ideas too. Some people love the idea of let's talk about a rhino conservation, let's talk about vulture conservation, let's do this, and other people uh, and other countries don't. Um, it's very much a touch and go, and that's why you have very specialized producers and people that sell your programs to um, companies and distribution companies that are looking for that specific uh, program. It's not a um, homogenous system not even close to being one so yes you have these wonderful ideas to tell the story of let's say the black mambas um, that we've had on um, unlocking and on uh, share screen africa but then you choose the correct channel the correct distributor the correct um, continent that you want to show it to because not all not everyone is always interested in all of the others in all of the stories that you can tell it is a bit um, it, it's not the most encouraging of, I, of, of of things that I'm going to tell, but that's unfortunately what it is. It is what is fashionable um, at the given moment in time. Sometimes uh, the, the market is completely inundated with stuff on rhino poaching. And then you don't necessarily make another one on rhino poaching because there already is 300,000 uh, videos on rhino poaching. And there's only so much you can tell about rhino poaching until everyone knows about it. So, um, or you have a really brilliant script writer, really brilliant idea, or a really brilliant director of photography. And, um, and you can tell it in a different way, but it's very much who you sell your ideas to. But there's always a market for everything. You just need really smart people to know how to pitch, um, and that's a that's a that's a whole different ballgame. That's what the producers do uh, to pitch your story. Um, but yes, it's not. There is a movement away from. Okay, they're making Planet Earth three now, but um, um, to to tell the really blue chip documentaries about. Um, this beautiful ledge and it's important to tell those stories because so many people never get well, most of the people on earth never get to see these things and appreciate the beauty but um, there's always space for um, telling the real conservation stories you just need to be smart uh, to who you sell it to that's a that's a loaded answer it's an <laughs> and that's actually an art it's an art form to uh, to sell the programs to the correct people and the correct channels and um uh, those people are quite impressive and wonderful. Cool. Thanks very much. Cool. Um, Thank you. Hi, Johan. We can take your question. Thank you, Prudence. I've got two questions for Ruan. Um, Ruan, first of all, what is your least favorite animal to film and <laughs> why? And then also, um, who's your favorite movie director? But before you answer, I would just like to quickly do a commercial break. Um, and remind you all of Rita Kovas' talk um, next week. She tried her best to join us this evening, but things didn't want to work out. Um, she's going to be talking on sociable weavers and ground hornbills. They are both cooperative breeders, which means the parents are assisted by helpers when raising the chicks. She will be talking about what these helpers do and whether having helpers is beneficial to counter the negative effects that droughts at and heat waves have on reproduction. So please join us for that next week. And that is the commercial break done. Ruan, over to you. Okay, so there's this, this 
no unwritten rule in filmmaking never work with animals and children and my entire career has always been animal and children <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't actually no um it's a good question you want um mm, least favorite animal to film i love them all they're, they're really cool i mean if you really get a beautiful sequence out of them and this is also really important you just uh, don't just film an elephant walking past you actually have to film some behavior otherwise you make up stories that makes absolutely no sense and you have to film um them drinking or what what not so but uh i mean crocodiles aren't really very exciting to film <laughs> they just lay there they don't do they don't do much um uh um yeah exactly so you know the reptiles uh it's interesting i don't know favorite movie director oh my goodness that's another difficult one i love so many movies hmm. can i get back to you on that there's <laughs> 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 so many genres that i love um uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, good question. But the animals, I love them all. I really love them all. And if you really spend time uh, behind the camera, you really get to form some really interesting stuff. Um, we were in the, um, when we were in the Congo, we were filming the gorillas, like so many people before us. And when we showed Magda Bermejo, who is the head of the research there at Ngaga Camp in Otsala, um, she said how invaluable our footage is because now she gets to see things that she knows happens but you can actually see it now it's documented it's there on a screen so it's really cool um and that is that goes for anything and everything um so uh, yeah least favorite animal i don't know um i love them all i really do love them all but <laughs> I, I know crocodiles are a bit boring they just like <laughs> we've never really filmed them a lot <laughs> Um, thank you, Ruan. We have a question on the chat from Prashant. They say, hi, how to collaborate with other funding agencies for shooting the wildlife documentary? Uh, that, is, that, is, that is a difficult one. And that's a loaded question because that's crawling and groveling and asking and pitching your idea to absolutely everyone there is and hoping that someone uh, says yes and says, oh, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Let's go in. I have money to do it. Um, and that's all that's something and funding is something that I didn't touch on in my talk, but these are really expensive things to do. It's a really, really expensive um, uh, uh, process to do wildlife documentary filmmaking. Um, you talk about anything from 50,000 to a hundred thousand dollars to make a proper uh, a one hour documentary or three one hour documentaries. It's a really expensive process. So you want to go to people who have money. <laughs> and that's why you usually go to distribution houses or massive channels um, like, uh, the, not the BBC, but uh, um, Blue Ant. Uh, um, uh, we made, a, a, we, we collaborated with Blue Ant and the uh, Smithsonian TV a few years ago where we did. 81 hour wildlife documentary uh, programs that was a colossal project uh, we basically never slept um, but that's a really difficult thing to do because it's so expensive so all you do you make sure that you have the best budget that you have an incredible pitch an incredible document and you blow them away with ideas that no one's ever heard of although everyone's all uh, has filmed elephants <laughs> a million <laughs> times <laughs> Um, hi, Marty. We can take your question. Well, thanks, Ron. Um, I, I might ask a bit of controversial question, and I uh, hope uh, I don't make too many enemies out of it. But um, you know, the, the, you're talking about genres of filmmaking, and you had mentioned the the wranglers and that sort of thing, uh, animal handlers. Um, there, there's, I think, a genre that probably started with the sort of adventure documentary kind of uh, John Varty sort of style of you know, this is the leopard today, tomorrow, the next day, you know, it's all, all happening within one day and it's actually seven years worth of footage and there, there's like a story that's almost made up and I think that that was maybe good at the time and I think it got many people interested in Wild Duff, so it probably had a place. But then the other one, old Steve Irwin and his tight shorts and uh, things that I think stretched it to another, another realm and, yeah, just your sort of feelings on that if you can kind of comment on it. I mean, again, I think it has a place, but there's a lot of unethical things I think that were happening in some of those um, 
those uh, movies and videos and things. So God, maybe just some of the ethics of filming and staging things and handling animals that, you know, the thing was in a fridge so it wouldn't run away and then it was put on the sand and, you know, like actually only filming animals and doing their natural thing. I don't know if you've got any sort of thing to say about that. So, um, Morty, that's a really good question. And I can only speak for home reforms. Um, our entire wildlife team, we are all classically trained scientists um, in natural sciences. Um, and we work, we always, almost always work with scientists in the field, researchers in the field, conservationists in the field. And we always follow the rules. Uh, we never break them. That's really, really important. Um, we don't go out. We don't destroy. We're not destructive. Um, we don't, we're not demanding uh, because it's nature. You can't, I mean, I, I'm not going to prod an elephant to stampede over a warthog or whatnot. Uh, and there are people that do it. I know there are people that do it. Um, and they make life really difficult for um, production houses, other production houses. Uh, they break the rules. They do break the rules. Uh, there was a very, it was one of the big channels a few years ago um, that were filming baboons in Roy Els, which is a small little coastal town um, up the up the coast. And um, they rigged an entire, they, they rented a house, they rigged the entire house so that the baboons could break into the house and they filmed the baboons breaking in, which is, which is horrible. It's really horrible. Luckily, the authorities uh, got hold of them and they were um, reprimanded. But uh, that changed the whole game for the rest of us. It makes it really difficult now to film anything. You have to apply for a lot of permits and a lot of it, which is good, which is perfect. Um, but as far as is humanly possible, we always uh, follow the rules because we respect and um, um, we, we, we all come from a background where um, we actually love nature before we started filming nature. Um, but yeah, you know, there's lots of there's lots of lots of lots of companies who break the rules and do horrible things, um, and we always. But as homebrew, we always try to do our best um, to not only give back, but to follow the rules as far as is humanly possible. If it's not possible, if the researchers tell us no, you're not going to do it. Then we don't push, um, we don't do it. Um, so yeah, that's our. That's I can only speak for us um, from that. But yeah, I'm. I, I, so is there a body or authority that kind of tries to manage that or it's yes. kind of so self in, self regulated in, in in South Africa if you film in a national park uh, one of the South African national parks there's always a game ranger with you making sure that you don't break any of the rules um in the western cape you have people called ECOs um environmental officers that have to be on set with you um, if you fall in any given area and they make sure that you don't break the rules. Um, so yeah, there are people and there are uh, structures in place to make sure that you do follow the rules and that you don't break them. There are people that always cross the line. Um, it's not always easy. It's a very expensive process to, uh, to film in a national park, uh, really expensive. Um, and you have to explain really in detail what you want to do what you're going to do you have to have everything in place especially if you film with drones uh, drones are an absolute nightmare to film with uh they oh, give, really? you have wonderful wonderful pictures of it but it's really really difficult um the laws the regulations and everything is it's mind-boggling but there there are many people there are many organizations that make you follow the rules um if you follow the rules and if you follow the right channels to do so yes Cool, thanks, man. Um, hi, Aisha. We can take your question. My colleague. <laughs> <laughs> we work in the same office. Well, we sit next to each other, so it's cool. <laughs> hi, Mr. Schlebusch. I'm calling you that because you're older than I am. So um, on a lighter and a more personal note, I just want to know how has it changed the way you view sort of movies and TV, not necessarily wildlife documentaries? But I mean, series, do you look at it, the camera angle and sound and the color, or are you still able to relax and watch it? No, it's changed this for <laughs> <laughs> You can't watch it and think, what the hell? Were that? 
were they thinking? Was the cameraman drunk? Didn't they have another shot to do that? I don't like the music. So <laughs> it forever changes the way you watch television. Um, um, but it's good because you learn a lot. Um, um, but uh, it does take the fun out of it a little bit. But but that said, if you watch something and it's really good, then you really enjoy it. So it it, it pushes up the bar. But when you watch something that's just mediocre, I just switch off the television because why? Why did you even try? How did it <laughs> yeah. process? I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, it, it did change the way I watch TV for forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll go to the movies next week. <laughs> Thank you, Ruan. Thanks, Aisha. Ruan, I wanted to give you a suggestion for your least favorite film, the, um, Animal, uh, A Mosquito. You know, we've never filmed mosquitoes before. I did film Tetsy Flies before, and um, and um, that was not easy. That that was really not easy. That was not like it. We went to the a point. It was a research station. Up, I don't know near Valabora or somewhere. And uh, we, I mean, I had access to all the Tetsy Flies in the world. It was it was not. That was actually really not easy. You and there you go. The Tetsy Fly shoot was off. <laughs> <laughs> really bad we did wonderful and um and and, and i'm going to give it away morty that was actually one but the researchers told us let's let's try and put them on ice and see just cool them down a bit so that's what we did but i only did it because the researcher told me to do it um and then we got some shots out of it but uh let's say it flies horrible <laughs> was it was like i didn't enjoy that a week of filming <laughs> flies mm -mm. Mm -mm. And then one that people might not think is cool, but dung beetles on a dung heap is one of the most awesome things to video and film and you can be captured for hours watching these little guys uh, and they have fights and yeah, so. Oh, that's wonderful. And I mean, not only the dung, but the carrion beetles as well. I mean, they're beautiful to film. They're iridescent mm -hmm. greens and just wonderful to film and they fight each other. And okay, the smell's disgusting because I mean, you're, <laughs> you're a carcass, but whatever, the, the behavior is wonderful. It's really cool. <laughs> but yeah, you know, the tetsy fly, it wasn't like it. I didn't enjoy that. <laughs> Ron, I, I was inspired by remembering that you told me the story of how you struggled to film the Black Harrier. Now, I mean, oh, Lord. I it's, it's, it's <laughs> favorite animal. It's absolutely beautiful um, bird, but not not difficult to or not easy to film, apparently. So that's yeah. that's what inspired that question. Oh Lord, that was I forgot about the black area. That was just quickly. Um, before we even started filming, I went out with Rod. Um there I forgot his name completely. He he was on he was on um Chase Screen Africa. Oh, bloody hell. Rod um, um Rob Aldo? Simmons. Simmons, Rob Simmons, yes, thank you, Marie. And right. Rod and I went out for a week. A week. Every morning I got up at four. We met at the grounds of UCT and we drove off into the field and we walked and walked until we found nests. And then he told me, okay, let's mark it with the GPS. And uh, this is where you're allowed to come. You can film here. We bought a very specific hide um, that the cameraman and I sat in for days on end. And uh, those birds are insanely intelligent insanely intelligent they she knows she knew every single time that we were there no matter what i covered that hide with I, the hide was covered in any type of bush grass anything i could find she knew we were there and she would not she would circle the nest over and over again and the chicks are exposed and then you just have to move away because i mean the chicks are going to die so that's 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 just something that was that was really incredibly difficult um, we got a few shots, but that was really one of the most difficult shoots that I've been on, uh, just because the birds are so incredibly intelligent. They know you're there and um, you actually endanger the life of um, the chicks and the bird itself um, if you stay too long. Because they just, oh. she, she just does not, she does not land if you don't move away. Or well, she didn't. The end result was absolutely amazing. So well, that, was, that was actually Claudio, um, and he has the patience of a, I don't know what, but um, he's, he's remarkable. But that took months of filming. Um, the the little bit of footage that we get, that is months and months of filming that he spent in the field day after day after day, 
trying his best and uh, he, he eventually did it but the one i was on was you know, that was really difficult <laughs> wow everyone thank you once again um i don't think we've uh, got any questions left no hands up at the moment i think we've covered everything in the chat Mori, one more question. Ruan needs yeah. to sleep. Needs to work <laughs> no, that's cool. So, again, the one thing you, we haven't really spoken about is the costs. I mean, the actual camera equipment, what is the most expensive camera that you guys have? I mean, some of these things and like infrared cameras and all of that sort of stuff, you know, it's, it's not a thing that a person can ever own on their own. It's only that a company can. I mean, just maybe tell us about some of those numbers without revealing anything that you so... should <laughs> I think the most expensive lens we have is 1.5 million grand. Um, most expensive camera, 800 grand. Um, the drone and all its attachments, 900,000. Um, oh, there's so many things. Uh, uh, the underwater equipment's really expensive. Um, but yeah, the the uh, we 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 have that we have we usually filmed with a Sony F fifty five. We bought them for five hundred k each. That's just the camera, no attachments. Um, now we have the F A six, and I I'm not exactly sure how expensive they are. They're the Black Magics. So we're talking about millions of rands. Um, it's it's a it's an expensive game. It's a really expensive game. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I think the, the most expensive lens we have was 1.5 million. Hmm. And, that's that's the, and, yeah. and on one shoot, you've got a couple of them. It's not like there's only one camera that goes out. You've got a number doing different angles of different things, all cameramen yeah. on. Exactly, yeah. So we have two, usually two F55s, uh, two kits. Well, the, both the kits are the same. In our, in our case, it's different for every other a company um, or whatever the company is but in, in our case we have two kits two cameramen uh, they each have this exactly the same gear so they can film um, so yeah and then if you're lucky enough we have a spare uh, a spare kit because anything can happen anything can happen uh, <laughs> and it has happened so yeah usually uh, we go out with two three kits at most cool there thanks a lot man awesome talk Thank you very much. And there's nothing worse than the sound of a camera hitting the floor. No, yeah, I, <laughs> there was once a camera that uh, that landed on the on the main uh, fence of the Addo National Park, and you saw sparks flying. And I just turned around and walked away. <laughs> I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> I don't know what to think about this now. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful times. It's cool. Everyone, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everybody that um, listened tonight and it was part of the event tonight. It was wonderful to have you with us. Um, and please join us again next week. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Great to spend our Thursday evenings with you.